The Coming of the American Civil War, looking at how the American Civil War came about. Well, what were the causes of the American Civil War? By far, the most important cause was slavery. In fact, many would argue it's the only cause of the Civil War. The black African slave is the economic foundation of the South. Uh, that's because the South is built on the idea of the plantation. The well, plantation is a method for the mass production of a cash crop. Mass means an incredible amount of, large quantities of it. And a cash crop means that it's grown to be sold rather than to be used by the person growing it. So a plantation is a method to produce large quantities of some type of a crop that is going to be sold. Examples of that were tobacco, rice, and most importantly for the time that we're talking about, as you can see here, cotton. Plantations have a need, and that need is for large numbers of permanent cheap labor. And the question is, where do you get this type of labor? Because you need a lot of people out in the field doing a lot of work. And you don't want people that can up and walk away and you have to try to hire someone else. So you want large numbers of permanent cheap labor. And the answer is you buy, keep, and use slaves. And Southerners firmly believed that slaves were an absolute necessity. Slaves dramatically improved the productivity of plantations. In fact, plantations, they thought, could not operate without slaves. As a result, from the Southern point of view, slavery is absolutely, totally, non-negotiably essential to the South. Talking about anything that has to do with slavery is off the table as far as conversations go. In 1820, this issue of slavery had created a conflict. There was a territory that wanted to become a state, and that was Missouri. And the issue here is, what can Missouri do if it enters as a slave state? Well, it'll unbalance the Senate. The South will have more senators than the free states in the North. The answer was the Missouri Compromise. Missouri is entered into the Union as a slave state. Maine is created as a new state and entered into the Union as a free state. The balance in the Senate is kept. The line at the bottom of Missouri, 3630, is drawn out as far as the United States owns territory. Everything south of 3630 will be slave territory. Everything north of 3630 will be free territory. That's the operation of the Missouri Compromise. And it's uh, not a terribly big deal uh, because it seemed to settle it at the time. But look at the map. The map shows you the unorganized territory up here and the little tiny territory of Arkansas down there. Oh dear. It looks like there's not going to be a, as many slave states as there are free states if this unorganized territory up here gets carved up into maybe five, six, seven states. But along comes Texas independence, and that offers an opportunity. Americans have entered Mexico, and they lived in this Mexican state of Texas, where they uh, caused trouble for Mexico. And they force Texas independence from Mexico, Mexico disputes the boundaries of this new independent Texas. And this new independent Texas says, we want to become part of the United States. Texas will become a state, a southern slave state, and it retains the option to divide itself up into as many as five, five separate states. So Texas could become five, instead of one, five slave states. That'll help offset all these states 
that will develop up in that unorganized territory. The United States, because of Texas, finds itself at war, at war with Mexico. And this threatens to upset the Missouri Compromise. The United States is going to gain all this land out here in the brownish color. All of that land. And to the southern states who fought this war with Mexico, their purpose was to gain all new slave states. Look at how many slave states you can get now. They'll outbalance all of those states in the north, hopefully. And the south will continue to control the United States government through the Senate. The Mexican secession here is going to become a big, big problem because the North introduces a provision into the House of Representatives called the Wilmot Proviso, and that Wilmot Proviso says that no slavery will exist in the lands that were given to the United States by Mexico at the end of the war. That totally upsets the Southern plan to have new slave states maintain the balance of the Senate or even control the Senate. Not only that, but at the same time all of this is going on, even at the moment that the war with Mexico is occurring, in the North, the abolitionists are pushing their cause. Who are the abolitionists? The abolitionists are the people who want to end slavery, and they want to do it either by law, or if they can't achieve it by law, many of them want to do it by force. The population in the North is now so large that the North has an absolute majority in the House of Representatives and will into the foreseeable future. And increasing numbers of those representatives from the North are abolitionists. So as our little Southern planter here says, those Yankees are fixing to control the Union, we got to take action. I say, let's leave this cursed union. And the talk of secession grows and grows and grows. Why? Because the Southerners are engaged in, in preserving one thing, slavery. And the North is increasingly threatening the existence of slavery. So we have a crisis. Henry Clay, in 1850, tries to resolve that crisis. He puts forward five bills that will constitute a compromise. And the intention is to balance everything in the Senate, to balance the interests of the North and the South, and to maintain the Union to reduce tensions. But Henry Clay is a very, very sick man. He's dying. He's not able to get it through the Senate. And... Along comes Stephen Douglas from, from uh, Illinois, and he sort of takes control in the Senate away from Henry Clay, who is really at home at this time uh, on death's door, and pushes through the compromises one great big bill. And you can see what this bill does. California is admitted as a free state in the Union. That's a clear victory for the North. Popular sovereignty will determine the slavery issue in Utah and New Mexico. What is popular sovereignty? Popular sovereignty means that the issue will be decided by the people of each one of those territories voting on whether they want to be slave or free at the time they become a state. The Texas border dispute is settled with the territory of New Mexico uh, which was part of what was gained from, from Mexico in the war. Texas gives up a claim to New Mexico, and the United States 
pays Texas $10 million to settle Texas's debt. The slave trade itself, that is trading, buying and selling slaves, is abolished in Washington, D.C., but slavery, slavery continues in Washington, D.C. So this is a modest win, a modest win for the North. And then a strong Fugitive Slave Act is passed with the idea that it will force the return of runaway slaves. This is a clear victory for the South. This is the Compromise of 1850. But by 1854, that compromise is already out the door as Congress begins to pass the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And this act is brought to the Senate by, oh, none other than Stephen A. Douglas, who got, who got the Compromise of 1850 through. So four years later, he's throwing what he got through the Senate in 1850 out and replacing it with a new bill called the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And what it does is it takes all the territories out there in the West, and it divides them up into the territories of Kansas and Nebraska and helps them move towards statehood. So we create two new territories, Kansas and Nebraska, and the people in each of these territories will vote on whether their state will be free or slave at the time it becomes, becomes uh, a state. Popular sovereignty just like it was applied out there in Utah and New Mexico. What caused the Kansas-Nebraska Act? Well, the slave South hoped, hoped to gain more slave states. It just needed to take some of that territory in the North and open it up to slavery. And so, if it could get the possibility of having a vote Maybe it could win the vote when those territories became states and create new slave states where they could never be created before. To do this, the Missouri Compromise has to be repealed because the territories of Kansas and Nebraska are north of the Missouri Compromise line. And what were the effects of passing the Kansas-Nebraska Act? Well, Slavery in the territories is left to the popular vote, popular sovereignty, and the result of that is violence. Kansas becomes a miniature civil war site where pro-slavery and anti-slavery factions rush people into the state to try to get enough people to vote it through, and then they start fighting each other, and then they start really killing each other. And as a result of the violence that happens in Kansas, which was called Bloody Kansas, the tensions between the North and the South get worse. So, it further divides the North and the South. It eventually leads to the death of one of the two political parties, the Whig Party, and from the death of the Whig Party comes the creation of a Republican Party in 1854. And that Republican Party is a North-only political party. It only exists in the northern states. It is a free soil party. And it is a, actually a coalition. It's made up of abolitionists, free soilers, people who were in the free soil movement, anti-slavery Democrats, the old business Whigs in the North, and the anti-immigrant crazies called the Know-Nothings. And the creation of the Republican Party is part of what creates bleeding Kansas. The Republican Party is beginning to create the Anti-slavery forces are Republicans moving in there, and people, abolitionists like Henry Beecher Stowe, are sending these people crates of rifles and ammunition. Meanwhile, the Southerners are sending thugs, every criminal they could round up in the northern part of Missouri, pushing them across the border into Kansas and saying, go there, vote for slavery, and drive out these anti-slavery people. 
it's safe to say that the Kansas-Nebraska Act just didn't turn out very well. Pause. Pause and read this and read this uh, this comic strip to see how it's possible that bleeding Kansas could have been a cause of the Civil War. But remember, bleeding Kansas was caused by what? Slavery. So if you say bleeding Kansas is a cause of the Civil War, you're saying slavery is a cause of the Civil War. In 1857 came the Dred Scott decision. This was a decision of the United States Supreme Court. It was a case in which a slave, you see him there, Dred Scott had been taken into the Illinois, brought back to Missouri. Dred Scott claimed he was free because he'd gone into a free state, Illinois. The case went to court in Missouri, and then eventually it found its way to the United States Supreme Court, where Chief Justice Roger B. Taney said slaves didn't have the, have the rights of citizens, so Dred Scott couldn't sue. But he didn't, he didn't stop there. He should have, but he didn't stop there. That should have been the end of the case. But he went on to say, he went on to say that as the court reviewed it, the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional under the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution because Congress could not do anything that took away the right to property, and that included the right to a, the property of a slave, in this case, Dred Scott. What this does, what this decision does, is it says that slavery is legal in every state in the Union. It basically says that the, that the U.S. government and the states can't block slavery in any state. Wow, the South is happy, elated, jubilant. It looks like they've won this thing. It looks like they've got what they always wanted, slavery everywhere. And President James Buchanan is off to a rocky start. Because in the North, the Northerners are madder than hornets. And here, pause and look at this cartoon. Read it carefully. And, and see how the Dred Scott case could have led to the Civil War. Finally, after the Dred Scott case, there is an incident in Virginia. Abolitionist and mass murderer from Kansas, the bleeding Kansas phase, John Brown, stages a military attack on a federal armory at Harper's Ferry in Virginia. Today, that's in West Virginia. He attacks federal troops. And eventually, he is captured and hanged. But the South says, look, the abolitionists have stopped trying to get rid of slavery by passing laws. They are now going to use force. They are going to encourage slave uprisings. And right after John Brown, along comes the election of 1860. We have four candidates. Stephen A. Douglas, you remember him from the Senate conversations. He's the Democrat in the North, because the Democrat Party has split in two. There's a Northern Democrat Party and a Southern Democrat Party. Stephen A. Douglas is the Democrat in the North. Breckenridge is the Democrat in the South. A person named Bell 
has a new political party called the Constitutional Union Party, whose sole objective is to keep the union together. And then, of course, the new Republican Party, which is only in the North, nominates Abraham Lincoln. And when the election is over, Lincoln wins all the northern states except for New Jersey, which splits his vote between Lincoln and Stephen Douglas. Lincoln wins 180 electoral votes because the population in the North is now so great that the Northern states hold enough electoral votes to elect a president. Lincoln is elected. This looks like a repeal in a way, a turn back of the ideas of Dred Scott and what the Supreme Court said. The people have voted against this because Lincoln is for no slavery in the free states and no slavery in any of the territories that haven't become states yet. This means that South is totally shut out and the Southerners say, that's it. We're taking our ball. We're going home. We quit the game. Don't come and talk to us anymore. The South secedes. Secession means leaving, dropping out of, breaking away from. The South is breaking away from the United States. And the state of South Carolina is the first one to do it. It secedes from the Union on December the 20th, 1860. That's mere days after Lincoln has been elected. This action makes the front pages throughout the U.S. Here you see the front pages of a northern publication called Harper's Weekly. And you can see the major members of the southern uh, congressional delegation. They're all packing their bags, saying goodbye, leaving, and saying we're out of here. After Lincoln wins the election, of course, as I said, South Carolina leads, leaves. It's followed by Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. And then, after that, the states in the northern part of the South, not the Deep South, those were the Deep South states, they went first. The states in the northern part of the South also leave Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and the last of them to go is North Carolina. They form what's called the Confederate States of America. They elect a senator from Mississippi, Jefferson Davis, to be president of this new country, as they want to call it. And they say they're a free and independent country. This is going to lead to trouble, and the trouble centers around a place called Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter is a fort on an island, as you can see it here, out in the middle of Charleston Harbor, Charleston, South Carolina. This is a picture of what Fort Sumter looked like at the time that I'm talking about, okay? This is Fort Sumter. Notice the cannons on the top. These are the areas here, down here, where all the work was done to protect and drag munitions up there and all of that type of thing. The fort was used to protect the harbor. And the, and the Confederates in Charleston demanded that the Federal Army in Fort Sumter surrender it to them. The Federal troops refused to surrender it. Things got kind of nasty. Food was running out, that type of thing. Lincoln said, I'll resupply this Federal fort in Charleston Harbor. I'll send ships to resupply it. I won't push my way through the land. I'll just send some ships down and they'll resupply the fort. The Southerners say, no, 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 no. So the Southerners decide to fire on Fort Sumter. 
and the South starts the Civil War. So let's review what we've said so far. What's happened? This issue of slavery has come to a head in the election of 1860. After Lincoln is elected, the Confederate States of America are formed. Each state is to be independent in the Confederate States of America. They just work together as a group to help promote their own interests. They elect as their president, Jefferson Davis. You see him right here in the picture. Seven states have seceded. The first go is South Carolina. And eventually, the Confederate capital will be in Richmond, Virginia. Now, other causes have been suggested besides slavery, but most of the time when you look at them very carefully, even though I'm going to list these causes, they really are tied into the issue of slavery. The first one of these is sectional differences. Differences between the North and the South. So what were some of these regional differences? Well, the North was industrial, the South was agricultural. The North had very few imports. The North produced a lot of what it used, but Southerners imported almost everything they used because they sold cotton, and they used the money they sold cotton in Europe to import all the things they wanted. The North wanted high tariffs. So the tariffs are taxes on anything that comes into the country to make it more expensive so it's competitive with things that are produced in the country. The Southerners wanted low tariffs. They didn't care where they got it from, they just wanted to get it cheap. The North grows its own food. It can easily feed itself without any problem. The South grows cotton. And in the end, the South does not grow enough food to actually feed itself. A part of the food that people in the South eat actually comes from the North. The North supports free labor. People who aren't slaves, who are working for wages or farming on their own family farms. But Southerners support slave labor because, as we saw, slave labor, is they believe, is essential to running a plantation. And the South is agricultural, and it depends on growing cotton and exporting that cotton so that it can make money and buy the things that Southern plantation owners want. In addition to this, I would say one thing that I didn't put on here, and that is the South came to believe the stuff it said about itself. It came to believe that it had a totally different culture than the rest of the United States. Southerners live differently, think differently. They even have different literature, and their religion is different and better. The Southern, they came to believe in a, in a whole idea called the Southern way of life. Now, the Southern way of life could be built around the things you see on the South. But when they say Southern way of life, it means a lot more. It means a mystical experience. It means Southerners have different attitudes, different sensibilities, different expectations. And to a certain extent, they even saw themselves as having different and better rights. All right, let's look at a third cause. The third cause is somewhat tied into sectional differences, but here we're being much more specific. Economic differences. The South's economy is built on plantation agriculture. The South grows crops. And it grows crops to sell crops to make money. The South's entire, entire economy is built around this plantation agriculture. But in the North, 
The economy is based on manufacturing or making things in factories, foundries, all of those types of things, plus a large number, in fact, most of Northerners still, live on small family farms. In the South, the economy is based on exporting cotton. In other words, they make their money by selling to other countries. But in the North, the economy is based on selling what they produce in their factories and mills, within the United States itself mainly, and living off the food that their own small farms produce. The economies of the North and South are very different. The South is agricultural and based on selling to foreigners. The North is rather self-sustaining. It takes care of itself. It could or could not export or import because it basically was able to take care of itself. The South wasn't. It needs to sell cotton in order to buy the things that it wants. And finally, although this doesn't appear in your book, the idea of it appears in your book, and that is the acceptance of John C. Calhoun's theory of government. John C. Calhoun was a senator from South Carolina. Uh, he was Jackson's vice president. He was secretary of war several times. Uh, and he was the person who most represented the South's interests in the Senate. He developed a specific idea of what American government should be, be based on the South. Remember we said the South is different. Calhoun's idea was the federal government had to have provisions, mechanisms in it, that would protect the way of life in the South forever. And this protection specifically includes ensuring that the Southerners will be able to own slaves forever. Calhoun basically said that the South must always have a veto over any law that is passed. Even if the South doesn't have a majority and it's able to block it in the Senate or in the House, there has to be some way in which the South can say, no, we don't approve of this law and it can't, whatever's passed through Congress can't become law. The Southerners really came to believe this concept that John C. Calhoun put forth. And really, the Southerners converted it into some, some principle that they claimed they found in the Constitution called states' rights, and that was the idea that the South could veto any law because states could just not follow the laws if they didn't want to. So Calhoun's idea of the federal government is one based on the South having a veto because all the southern states could simply say, we veto this law because we're, we just don't uh, accept it as existing as a law, period. But the election of Lincoln shows that the North has eliminated any system of protection the South says that it might have. And the reason is because the South looked and they said, no one in the South voted for this Lincoln scoundrel. Well, there's a couple reasons why. One reason is because Southerners didn't like him. But an even more important reason why you could actually say no one voted for him is, in every state in the South, they refused to put Lincoln on the ballot. So that when you went to vote, Lincoln wasn't there to vote for even if you wanted to. So then the Southerners cry, oh, 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 oh. None of us voted for it. If we didn't vote for him too, well, he can't be president. Another use of this concept of Calhoun's Southern veto. And then they turn around and say, well, states rights, states rights, states rights. We've got to use states rights to protect slavery. 
We're not using states' rights for states' rights. We're using states' rights to protect slavery.